Hey, it's so wonderful we can begin our service with baptism. And it's always fun for me uh, when I'm able to, to, to baptize a uh, a couple. It's a lot of fun to see a, a husband and wife go through these waters together. And so we're going to see that this morning. So Denton and Savannah, y'all come on down. This is Denton and Savannah. They've been coming to our church for a while. Denton's in the Coast Guard. They'll be here and gone. Yeah, be here and gone. Uh, but they, they come from, from just different... Christian traditions growing up and have not had the opportunity to be baptized by immersion. So they're coming today as followers of Jesus to say, hey, we belong to, to, to Jesus Christ. He's changed us and we belong to the family of God. And so it's a joy uh, as they come and, and show you what Christ has done in them through their baptism. So didn't go ahead. Didn't have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Yes. It's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bearing his death. Ladies again to welcome Minus and Ryan. Savannah, have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Yes, sir. It's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in his death, raised again to welcome newness of life. Let's pray for this couple. Father, thank you so much for Denton and Savannah and for the work of grace that you've done in their lives. God, you've given them a, a precious family. Uh, you've given them a wonderful place to be over the next year or so as they serve here in Charleston. Father, you're doing great things in their lives, and I thank you for that. And so help them as they continue to walk by faith, help them to trust you, to continue to grow, uh, to continue to be the man and wife that you've called them to be for your kingdom. Father, continue to shower them with your grace and love and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we've got one more, and Nick Glidden is going to come and baptize a dear friend. So come on, Nick. You want to know? Come on. Good morning, church family. So this morning we've got Chanel. Chanel is uh, soon to be part of my earthly family. She's going to be marrying my uh, nephew here in not too much longer. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, she professed her faith in her Lord, Jesus Christ. And this morning, she's going to celebrate that by her public profession of faith. So, uh, Chanel, have you trusted the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior? Yes. Do you promise to follow him the rest of your life? Yes. With that, I pronounce you. I uh, baptize you as my sister. <laughs> We're training them, right? <laughs> as my sister. Buried in his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Let's pray. Father, it is so great to have another child enter into your kingdom, God. We, as a church, celebrate this public profession of faith. And Lord, as a church, we promise to walk beside Chanel as she goes through this journey. And Lord, we just pray that she continues to seek you and learn to grow in intimacy with you each and every day of her life. Lord, I um, ask that she continue to grow in you and that she uh, desires more and more of you every day. In your name I pray. Amen. Awesome.
Listen to this passage of scripture real quick from Romans um, chapter eight. Romans chapter eight, beginning in verse 14. Uh, Paul writes and says this, for all those led by God's spirit are God's sons. That's you, sons and daughters of the king. If you follow Jesus Christ, you are led by God's spirit. Listen to what he says. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Father, what a glorious thought that we can call you Father. And you're everything that a father is supposed to be. You're good, you're gracious, you're kind, you're compassionate, you're, you're loving, you're gentle, you're merciful, you're wise. And this glorious reality, as a father, you've rescued us out of sin and death through your son, Jesus Christ. Through his death and resurrection, we've been adopted into your family. You're a father who knows us. And Father, I don't know every need of every person in this room this morning. I know that there are, are, are many of us perhaps that come to this room with a lot of burden, a lot of worry, a lot of struggle for lots of different reasons. And Father, in this room and this morning, you know every single one of us. You know the struggles, you know the burdens, you know the hardships. And you know right now how you want to minister to us today, how you want to give us peace in the midst of our storm. You know right now the work you're doing in us, maybe a work that we can't see right now, but you're doing it because you're faithful to complete in us what you begun. You are our father. And you are the father who wants your family to be really, really big. And as we're in this room this morning, there are churches all over this community who are proclaiming the grace of Jesus Christ. And today there are gonna be people who come into your family, who experience adoption. Father, as we're out in our community this week and we're sharing the hope of Christ, it's my prayer that we'll see people come and be part of your family. That through, through our testimony, through our sharing the gospel, people will trust Christ as Lord. You want a big family. And I thank you that we get to be a part of your family and we get to, to experience your work through us as your family is expanded. So Heavenly Father, be glorified today, be exalted, be lifted up, be magnified, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and stand back up. Let's continue to worship together.
All right, take your Bibles and turn back to the Gospel of Luke. We're in Luke chapter 11 this morning, Luke 11, verses 1 through 13. If you're new to Northwood, we like to take books of the Bible like the Gospel of Luke and just walk straight through these books of the Bible. We've been in Luke's Gospel for some time now and continue our journey this morning, Luke 11, 1 through 13. If you're new to the Bible, Luke is real easy to find. It's the third Gospel in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then the Gospel of John. Luke 11, 1 through 13. If you did not bring a Bible in the seat before you, down in the book rack, you'll find a copy of the Bible, pick that Bible up, find Luke chapter 11 with us, and uh, we'll read that together in a moment. If you don't own a Bible, take that Bible home with you, read it and learn about the God that loves you and desires a relationship with you. Luke 11, 1 through 13 is where we'll spend our time together this morning. So here we are, we are in the midst of summer, and some of you in this room, you've been traveling, you've been on your summer vacations, you've been to the mountains, you've been to the beach, uh, you've been other places, you've been on mission trips, we've been all over the place, right? And so, so summertime, for some of you, maybe you like to go to an amusement park, you like to ride the roller coasters. Any of you like to ride the roller coasters? Yeah, you got problems, right? They're terrible. Like I, I don't understand. I never have understood the fascination of roller coasters to go and, and pay. I don't know how much. I'm like, if you go to Disney World, I mean, it's like a trillion dollars to go there. You pay all that money, you stand in line to have the, the bejeebies scared out of you. And it makes no sense to me, right? And some of you, you're like Disney fanatics. You go to the hottest place in the world and spend all your money to stay in line for three hours to ride. That's you, that's fine. Hey, it's their own. But anyway, roller coasters, just not my thing. And if you've been watching the news lately, you've seen there have been some roller coaster problems. The one at Carowinds, did you see that? There was a big crack in it, had a structural problem. That's real encouraging. I read an article this past week about a county fair in Wisconsin where there was a roller coaster. Now, here's what I was told growing up, and, 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 and I don't know if this is true or not, but I was always told it's okay to ride the roller coasters at places like Carowinds and Six Flags because they're permanently installed. But the county fair, they throw them things up and take them right back down. And so I was always told not to ride those, which I thought was good advice. And anyway, but that's another story for another day. And so I read this article about this county fair in Wisconsin uh, on the roller coaster called the Fireball, which I'm not getting on that. But on this roller coaster called the Fireball, they were doing the loop. You know what happens? The roller coaster got stuck in the loop. In fact, I got a picture upside down. It's one thing to get stuck upside down. It's another thing when they can't get you down when you're stuck upside down. And they couldn't. They couldn't get the roller coaster started back up. I mean, and so they were just literally hanging upside down. And, and so they had to call in several fire departments from different counties. They had to find one of those big, big trucks with a hundred foot ladder and they brought that thing in. And, and by the time that thing got stuck till they got the first person off of that upside down roller coaster, that first, first person got off two hours later, two hours hanging upside down. And then it took them a couple more hours to get everybody off. And so by the time the last person was off, that poor person was hanging up there for several hours hours. This is why you don't ride roller coasters, right? But can you imagine? I mean, I don't know how it works. I've never been upside down that long, but I mean, I don't know how they, I, I'd have died. Like all the blood rushing to your head. I mean, oh Lord Jesus, take me home, please. I mean, it just, but that's what they did. They hung around upside down. Hey, I, I bet you uh, there have been lots of times in your life where you felt like life is upside down because it is. Life is upside down apart from Jesus Christ. And this is the beauty of the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are telling us the story of how Jesus Christ has come to make things right side up. Life with Christ is a life that is right side up. And a right side up kind of life is the kind of life, now watch this, a right side up kind of life is the kind of life that enjoys what Mary enjoyed in the passage we looked at last week, intimacy with our God. A right side up kind of life is a life where we live in and know and love being in the presence of God. A right side up kind of life is the kind of life where we actually enjoy talking to God. We're in a passage of scripture this morning that is very, very familiar to you. We call it the Lord's Prayer. It's probably better titled the disciples' prayer because Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. And it's this reminder that this is what God desires. He desires relationship with us. He desires for you to commune with him. 
This is a wonderful passage. And I, I know that as we read this passage, it, it, it's a very familiar passage, or I say familiar. We're most familiar with, with Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter six. Luke's rendition is a little bit different. We'll talk about that, but, but still it's very familiar to us. And, and you recite it maybe at weddings and funerals. And maybe if, if you've gone to a really traditional church before, you recite it there. But, but you know, for most of us, it's just a prayer that we memorized. But it's so much more than a prayer to memorize. Jesus is teaching us in this prayer how to commune well with our heavenly father. It's powerful. Not only that, right? I know that when we begin to talk about prayer in general, for a lot of us in this room, we immediately start to feel guilty. Because I, I don't think, I mean, I, and we're not gonna do this, but I think if I were asked for a show of hands as to how many of us thought our prayer life was awesome and amazing, uh, not many of us would raise our hands. Because we all know, myself included, that we struggle in this area, that we need to do better. Thankfully, we have a gracious God who doesn't guilt us because of our inability to pray well. We have a God who wants to help us to learn how to pray more effectively. And so I think this passage that's so familiar is gonna be very beneficial for us this morning as we continue to learn how to walk in a relationship with the God who loves us. Now, I gotta put out a disclaimer. We're looking at verses one through 13. The Lord's Prayer is verses one through four. So we're looking at a lot of text and, and I could take a lot of time and I, I know you don't want me to. I could take a lot of time and walk through this and, and, and amount out all the details. We just don't have to time to do that this morning. I want to give you a big overview of these verses and help you to think through them so you can begin applying them to your life this week. So take your Bibles, uh, Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. Go ahead and rise your feet as we honor the reading of God's Word. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. And Jesus said to them, whenever you pray, say, Father, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as uh, for we ourselves also forgive everyone in debt to us and do not bring us into temptation. He also said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I don't have anything to offer him. Then he will answer from inside and say, don't bother me. The door is already locked. And my children and I have gone to bed. I can't get up to give you anything. I tell you, even though he won't get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his friend's shameless boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the, the door will be open. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a, a snake instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Father, thank you that you desire a relationship with us and that you are helping each of us in this room who are followers of Jesus to grow in a relationship with you. Thank you now that we get to learn from Jesus himself how to effectively communicate with you. Lord, help us. Help us to listen well this morning. Help us to want to be a people who walk in a relationship with you. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. So you probably saw it as soon as I was reading through this uh, because most of us in this room were, were far more familiar with Matthew's gospel when he records the Lord's Prayer. And so you probably already noticed some differences as, as I read through these first four verses where, where Luke records the Lord's Prayer, the disciples' prayer for us. And, and so you see the differences. And, and then listen, I don't have all the answers for you as to, to why Luke chooses to record it one way and Matthew chooses to record it another way. But here's what, what I, I'm pretty sure happened, that, that Jesus uh, probably taught on prayer more than once. And, and, and that makes sense even from the context in the two gospels. When you go to Matthew's gospel, when Matthew gives us the Lord's prayer, it is in the context of what? The Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is teaching the multitudes. And as he teaches the multitudes, he gives that Lord's prayer in that gospel. And, and then in Luke's gospel, you know the context here because you've been following along for the past few weeks that, that we're 
we're now on the road to Jerusalem. And so as Jesus is on the road to Jerusalem with his disciples, one of the disciples asked, hey, John the Baptist, he teaches his followers how to pray. I mean, you know, we think you're the greatest rabbi there is. We think you're the Messiah. And so we need to hear from you. How do we pray? And so in that context, Jesus begins to give the Lord's Prayer. So I'm, I'm assuming that Jesus taught on prayer more than once and, and, and Matthew records it one way, Luke records it another way. But you know this, that, that while the words may be a little bit different, uh, the goal is the same. Jesus is teaching those who follow him how to pray. That's, that's what's going on here, right? He's teaching people who follow him how to pray. Now, Here's where it gets really interesting. Again, you and I don't think about this a lot because we're so familiar with these words. We've, we've heard these words over and over and over again. Uh, but if you're a first century follower of Jesus, man, I believe that, that when Jesus begins to talk about how to pray, that this would have been absolutely revolutionary. In fact, what I think, and just first truth I want you to see is that Jesus is teaching us that your heavenly father wants you to pray boldly. Because these four verses that contain the disciples' prayer or the Lord's prayer, these are bold words. And it, it starts bold. Father. Father. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but, but Jesus in the Gospels refers to, the, to God as Father a lot. Like in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, over 60 times, Jesus refers to God as his Father. In the Gospel of John, now watch, this is really interesting. Jesus refers to God as Father in the Gospel of John over a hundred times. Now, what's so interesting about that to me is that when you go back to the Old Testament, do you know how many times God is, is, is spoken of as Father in the Old Testament? 14 times. Isn't that wild? I mean, certainly uh, the Old Testament Israelites understood God as Father, but, but, but Jesus... He talks about God as father in a revolutionary kind of way. And now when you think of, of God as father, certainly all these things come to mind that, that you would expect as we think of God as the ideal or perfect father, that he's loving, he's gracious, he's kind, he's merciful, he's wise. I mean, we, we, we understand that about our father, that he's a nurturer, that he desires intimacy with his children. And we get all that, but I wanna, this is so fascinating to me. I want you to think about the first time in the Old Testament, the first time in the Bible where God is thought of as a father. Let me, let me show you. Go back to Exodus in Exodus chapter four, verses 22 to 23, just real quick. You know what's going on here. Uh, Moses is, is there before God at the burning bush and God is speaking to Moses. He wants Moses to go into Egypt and, and, and let the people go from Pharaoh to deliver the Hebrews. And listen to what the Bible says. And you will say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. I told you, let my son go that he may worship me, but you refuse to let him go. So, so God... The father sees Israel as his child. Are you following me? And what is this father about to do for the Hebrew people? The father is about to rescue them. Let me tell you why that's good. Because that's what fathers do, right? At least that's what good fathers do. And some of you have been there. You remember when you were a hard-headed, stubborn teenager and the number of times your dad bailed you out. Come on. Some of you are fathers now with teenagers. <laughs> You've bailed them out, haven't you? Because that's what fathers do. Fathers rescue. And now here, now this is where this gets so good. Here you have Jesus. His disciples ask him, well, can you, we see you pray, Jesus. Your prayer is, you're, it's effective. When you pray, God answers. Can you teach us how to pray? And Jesus says, well, start by calling your God, Father. Because he rescues you. This is what Jesus has come to do. The Father has sent the Son, the only begotten Son, into this world to die the death we deserve, to rise from the dead, to rescue us. You see, I, I believe that when Jesus teaches his followers to pray, Father, he's certainly telling them, hey, you've got this intimate relationship with God, that he's, he's, he's your father, he's, he has adopted you, all those kinds of things. But I, I also think that Jesus does not want his followers to forget that your father has rescued you. And then it happens. Jesus gives them the specific instructions. There are several petitions 
in this prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray. Now, we're gonna go faster this, so, so hang on, but here's what I need you to note. That this prayer is what? And you probably already know this. It's vertical before it's horizontal. In other words, that, that when Jesus is teaching us to pray, he's teaching us to put our eyes not on ourselves, which we often do when we pray. We come before God and say, God, I got a list of things I'd like for you to do for me. Let me give you my list, God. You see my list? I, there's this, this, and this. And would you mind helping me here? And, and certainly we, we are invited to come before our Father and, and to bring our list, if you will. But Jesus is teaching us, wait, before you bring your list, come before your Father and you worship Him. Your name is holy. Now, if you were an ancient Jewish person, you understood the holiness of God. You knew the stories of the Old Testament. You knew how, how God had shown up in different ways and, and shown himself as holy. And now Jesus is saying to his followers, his disciples, don't forget this, he's holy. You come before him and worship. You see, we're the kind of people that like to worship ourselves, right? We're so self-absorbed. And so that's why we come before God with our list. God, do this, do this, do this. You, you do what I ask. No, no, no. Jesus says, get the right frame of mind when you pray. Come before God, acknowledge him as your father who loves you and you worship him. He's holy, right? His name should be honored among you. But he doesn't stop there. You know how it goes, don't you? So as you, father, your name is holy. You're what? Your kingdom come. Now let's just go through this quickly. And you understand because we've already seen this in the gospel of Luke, what Jesus is getting to. You understand that the kingdom of God is a big deal to Jesus, that there is a king who rules and reigns. And when we talk about the kingdom of God, what we're talking about is the reign and rule of God. When you submit your life to Jesus, you're in the kingdom. You recognize that God is the king over your life. Wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be amazing if every person you knew recognizes God as king over their lives? They don't. You understand that. In fact, you know that God is king over your life and there are times in your walk with Jesus that you still choose to rebel and not acknowledge him as your king. But just imagine what this world would be like if everyone submitted to the reign and rule of God. That's what Jesus, you see, is, is, is upward. Jesus is teaching us to pray in such a way that we recognize that, that the priority of God is that we know that he is God, he's holy, and that his kingdom matters more than anything else. That his reign and rule is, is what he's interested in. That he wants people to submit to his reign and rule. So pray that way. Pray for God's kingdom to come in your life. That, that when you live before God, you live before him with an attitude and a posture of surrender. Pray for God's kingdom to come in the lives of others, your family members, your friends, your coworkers, in the lives of people you don't know. This is the prayer. You start upward. God, I'm gonna worship you and I want your kingdom to come. And it's a now, not yet kind of prayer that I want your reign and rule in my life now, but there's also a not yet. I know there's gonna come a day when the trump sounds, the clouds open and Christ returns. And when Christ returns, then once and for all, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what we long for. More than we long for our own kingdoms or our own will to be accomplished, we want the kingdom of God to come. We want people to recognize his rule and reign. And so Jesus says, pray that way. Now, now here's why this is so important. It's vertical before it's horizontal. When you begin praying in this way, God, my Father, you're holy, your kingdom come, your will be done, then it affects the way you do what? Pray for your daily needs. Are you following? Because when we come before God with our list, oftentimes that list of things we come before God with, it's really selfish sometimes, isn't it? And, and again, it's not at all wrong to pray and ask God uh, to, to, to meet your needs at all. But what have you started with God? When you pray, when I pray, what have we started with God? You're worthy of my worship. God, your kingdom come. I think that would change the way that we pray for our needs. Notice the prayer. Give us what, church? Our daily bread. Now, a couple of things. One, it seems so menial, menial, right? I don't know how many of you, when you got this morning, you had a piece of toast or what you had, but, but bread seems to be the most basic food, right? And so in part, it's an acknowledgement that God, even those very basic things that I have, they're a result of your hand. You give them to me, everything, even the bread that I eat, it came from you. 
And, and also watch this. I think that when we begin to pray in this vertical kind of way, Father, your name is holy, your kingdom come. Then when we, get to begin, when we begin to pray for our daily needs, we pray something like this. God, give me what I need to live out your will. Come on. That changes the way you pray. Because now when you're stricken with cancer in your body, Yes, pray for healing. That's not wrong. That's a good prayer. But also pray, God, your will be done. You know why I have this cancer and you know how you're gonna glorify yourself through it, right? Or when another life circumstances happens that's out of your control. Lord, I, I sure would like you to fix this, but Lord, you know better than I do. Your will be done. You give me what I need. Perseverance, wisdom, endurance, friends that, that love Jesus. You give me what I need that's gonna help me to live out your will because I just want your kingdom to come. And your kingdom, right, your rule might be best exhibited as I surrender my life to you in the midst of some of the hard seasons I go through. You see what I'm saying? And so when we start, are, are you following? When we start with God and we pray, God, you be magnified. You're my father who's rescued me. You be magnified in my life. Your kingdom come. Then that's gonna begin to change the way that we pray for our needs. Give us our daily bread and forgive us because we understand. And I, I know I'm going fast here, but just bear with me. We understand, right? That, that when we came to faith in Jesus Christ, all of our sins were forgiven, past, present, and future. Positionally, you are saved before God and you always will be as his child. But you also understand that while all your sins are forgiven, you keep on sinning. And that sin you keep on committing, it does hinder your fellowship with God. And there are those days that because of your sin, you don't want to. You don't want to spend time in prayer. You don't want to open the word or whatever the case may be. And so it's that, that acknowledgement that I need ongoing forgiveness. I need to come back before the Father and say, God, I messed up again. You've already forgiven me, but I'm acknowledging God, God, forgive my sins, right? Restore that fellowship. And then Jesus ends the prayer and lead us not into temptation because you know it. You know where you're weak. You know where you struggle. And it's coming before God and saying, God, you know that in this area, I have a tendency to give in to temptation. In this place, I have a tendency to give in to temptation. And so God, would you help me? Would you help me to stay away from those areas? Lead me not. Help me, protect me. Keep me from those areas in which I'm likely to stumble. And that's it. That's the Lord's prayer the disciples' prayer. And it is revolutionary because if you think about it, now, come on, this is where it's so powerful. As Jesus teaches us how to pray, how is he teaching us to pray? He's teaching us to pray in such a way that ultimately at the end of the day, we're coming before the heavenly father and we're saying, God, you are my father who's be worshiped. Change me. That's it. Change me. Align me with your will. Change me transform me. That's at the heart of this prayer that Jesus is teaching us to pray. It's bold. It's bold. It's not just help me pass the test at school next week. It's not just help me get a raise at, at work or I really like a new car. All those things are fine. You can pray for those things, but, but at the heart of this prayer is something different. God, change me. Align me with your will. Let your kingdom reign in me and in the lives of others. It's bold. And, and what we're gonna see as we move on the text, not only is it bold, Jesus is calling us not to pray this one time, but persistently. Your heavenly father wants you to pray boldly. Your heavenly father wants you to pray persistently. I had this week to, to go to one of my favorite stores. I had to go to Walmart because I had to get um, a gift card. Um, I was gonna get one of those Visa cards that had the money already on. You know what I'm talking about? You get them $100 here or five, whatever. So I was gonna go to Walmart to get one of those cards. So I walked into Walmart and I went to the, the gift card section and they had all kinds of gift cards wherever you wanted to go. And, and as I found the one I wanted, that Visa gift card that, that had the cash preloaded on it. And, and you know how it goes at Walmart. I mean, 
good or bad or indifferent. I'm not, you know, bashing the company, but you know how it works, right? You, you go to Walmart and, and they've got all these registers and, and there's only one that's open. And, you know, the line for that register is, I don't know, 4,000 people are in the line. All their grocery baskets are completely full. And then they have the self-checkout. So I'm not about to stand in that line where I'm gonna have to wait 16 hours to get out of there. And so I go to the self-checkout with my, with my little gift card. And, I, and, I, and there weren't many people at the self-checkout, thankfully. And so I, I walked with the self-checkout and I, and I took my little gift card and I, and I scanned that thing. And, and as soon as I scanned that thing, that, that light went red. You know what I'm talking about? And so when that light goes red, that means that the lady who's working at all those self-checkout registers has to come to me and, and fix my problem. And she comes to me and she sees my gift card and I was like, I, I scanned it and it doesn't work. And she looked at me and said, yep, it doesn't work. I'm like, well, I knew that. Can you help me? Can you make it work? And so she scanned again. She put some numbers, some codes in and, and the, the card didn't work. And she said, I can't do anything for you. I said, can you explain what you mean when you say you can't do anything for me? And she said, well, I, you, you, you can't. You got, you, this, this card doesn't work. You have to take it back and get another card. I said, I've got to get another card. She said, this one doesn't work. Go get another one. I'm like, you can't do that for me. You want me to go back and do, you want, and she said, and, and then she said, and when you get the card, don't come back here. Go stand in the line for the register. And I said, you're kidding, right? She said, no. I said, you can't do anything but tell me to go stand in another register. She said, that's it. You go stand in another register. I'm like, I should have went to Target, but I didn't. So I went back to the, the, the place where all the gift cards were and I, and I put that one back and I grabbed another one so somebody else could come get it and go through that same ordeal. So I grabbed another one and then I went and stood in the line. And I don't know, I mean, 20 minutes later, I'm at the front of the line. There's this gentleman there and I, and I give him my card. He scans it and it doesn't work. I'm like, he's like, this card doesn't work. I'm like, well, can you fix it? I mean, I, I, I get it. I mean, what, what, what do you want me to do? He's like, well, you need another one. I must like an, another one. So, so, so you want me to go back over there and get another card? He's like, yeah, this one doesn't work. And I said, what do you want me to do when I get the card? You want me to come and stand in this line again? He says, no, you need to go stand in the customer service line. I said, so there's nothing you can do. He said, there's nothing I can do. I said, you can't do anything. He said, I can't do anything. So I said, you really want me to go get another card? And he said, yeah. So, so I went back to the little kiosk where all the cards were. Now, now I kid you not, this is what I did. I grabbed 25 of them. <laughs> and I walked up to the customer service line and I stood in line at customer service and the lady looked at me kind of odd. And I said to her, I just want one of these. <laughs> to which she said, well, it looks like you have more than one. I said, yes, I know. Here's why. I took it over that line. It didn't work. I took it that line. They told me to bring it to you. I don't know which one works. But I'm bringing you 25 of them. I just want one of them. Can you make one work? And so she begins to scan and none of them worked. Not one of, and I'm just as patient as I can be and loving as I can be, just as gentle as I can be. I said, ma'am, none of these work? She said, no. I said, well, what do you want me to do? She said, you need to go back to the kiosk and get a different brand of card. I said, a different brand. And I said, then what do you want me to do? Come back here and we'll do this again. I said, you've got to be kidding me. And so I took the 25 gift cards back and then I grabbed, I kid you not, I grabbed, it must've been 150 gift cards. And I took 150 gift cards back up to the customer service. And I said, okay, here they all are. You find me one that works. And so she started scanning away. Long story short, after 18 hours in the Walmart, I walked out with one that worked. Now, now here's the moral of the story, right? Here's where I'm going with all this. I was persistent. You see what I'm saying? I wasn't giving up. I mean, I could have gone to Target and I probably should have gone to Target. But at that point, like, you're just trying to, you've got the cards here. One of these bad boys has to work. And I'm not leaving here until I find the one at work. Now, now here's the deal. I don't think the employees at Walmart love me. I mean, I, I, mean, I hope they think I'm a nice guy, but I, I, at the end of the day, I don't really think they care about me. I don't think they care if I got one that works or not. To be honest with you, I don't think they care a bit. But I wasn't leaving until I had one that worked. Now, I'll tell you that, I'll tell you this. You have a heavenly father who does love you. You have a heavenly father who wants what's best for you. 
You have a heavenly father who desires to answer your prayer. You see what I'm saying? And so Jesus is saying two things here. One, be bold. Come before him and pray for God to change you and be persistent. I mean, that's kind of the point of the, the next door. Now we got to go fast here, but look at what it says. You have verses five through eight and Jesus tells a simple story. He tells a story about a man who has some house guests come over. He wasn't expecting company. It's a big deal, right? He's got no bread for them. And so he goes, he knocks on his neighbor's house. It's midnight and he's banging on the door. Hey, I got no bread. Will you please help me out? And the guy says, wait a minute, it's midnight. My kids are in bed. What are you thinking? I'm not going to help you out, but the guy does what? He keeps on knocking. I got, I got, I got company. I need some bread. You only want to know what bread? Help me out. And listen to what the text says. I tell you, verse eight, even though he won't get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his friend's shameful boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Here's the deal, right? You've had people in your life, people that you love, your kids, your friends who've pestered you enough that you finally gave in, Right? We've all experienced that. And you've probably pestered somebody enough until they finally gave in. There's no pestering God. He's not asleep at midnight. He's the God that does not sleep, nor does he slumber. And he is the God who is always ready, ready to hear you. Why? Because he is a father who loves you. Now come down, let me show you something else. You come down, let's skip ahead to verses 11 through 13. Jesus goes on to say this, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then are, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, know how much more the heavenly father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. You know what he's saying, I have to tell you this. We're evil people, we're sinful, but yet as sinful people, you know how. You know how to bless your kids. You know how to bless your family. You know how even as an evil person to bless. Your father, who is not evil, who is perfect in every way, your father knows how to bless you. He wants to bless you. And so Jesus, as he ends up this section where he's teaching us to pray, he's just reminding us, pray bold and pray often because you have a father who hears and a father who wants to work on your behalf. Don't stop. Don't shut your mouth. Keep on going back to your father. Listen to what he says. You come back up. Verse nine. So I say to you, ask, it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Now I need you to know this, just a, you know, a, a grammar lesson, that when Jesus says ask, seek, and knock, it is present tense imperative. All that means is that it's ongoing, that Jesus is telling us do this over and over and over. Ask, seek, knock, Ask, seek, knock, and notice the promise. Ask, and you'll receive. Seek, you'll find. Knock, it will be opened. Now, there's a lot of late night TV preachers who've ruined the exegesis of this passage. And they've sold you a bill of goods, right? Name it, claim it. You want that Lexus, just pray big. God's obligated to give it to you if you have enough faith. And that's a bunch of baloney. This is not what this passage is teaching. This passage is not teaching us to name it, claim it, to pray for the big house, or whatever, right? Now, if you want to pray for a big house, that's fine, but that's not what this passage is teaching you. Here in Luke's gospel, it's a very specific context. In Matthew's gospel, Matthew in Matthew chapter 7, records these words as well in a very specific context. In Matthew chapter seven, now watch, come in close now. You gotta make sure you stay awake for this. In Matthew chapter seven, when Jesus is concluding the Sermon on the Mount, he says, ask, it'll be given to you. Seek, you will find. Ask for what? Well, the point of the whole Sermon on the Mount is you've got to live for Jesus the way he wants you to live for him. That's a problem. None of us can do it unless you ask for his help. You see what I'm saying? Ask. God wants to help you live out what church? His will for you. The same thing here in Luke's gospel. The context is a little bit different, but think where we are in Luke's gospel. We've just come through several chapters now, chapter nine and 10, where it's heavy on what? Discipleship. Take up your cross and follow him. I can't do that. How can I live for Jesus the way he wants me to live for him? Ask, seek, knock. 
I know, right? I know that it seems impossible to live for this one who lived and died and rose again for you. He puts high demands on our lives. It seems impossible. But no, no, listen to what Luke says. As Luke records these words, ask, seek, and knock. Come down again to verse 13. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You see what he's saying? God wants to empower you. He wants that as you walk with him by faith, as you trust him, as you align your life with his will, as you pray, your kingdom come. And as you ask God to help you to live for his kingdom, he will, he will. God will help you to live for him. He will help you to change your perspective of life. He will help you to change your attitude. He will help you to overcome sin. He will help you. The problem is for many of us, we're not asking God enough for the things that he wants to do in our lives. We're asking for all kinds of other things. Get me on my mess, right? Give me a raise, right? And again, there's nothing wrong necessarily praying those things. We're just not asking the main things. God, bring me into alignment with your will. Everybody's still awake. Are you with me? So what do you do? How this week do you begin to pray in such a way where you're using the Lord's prayer as a model to help you to pray effectively? Well, just a few things and we're done. One, start trusting. Seems easy enough, doesn't it? Trust. Trust that God does want to answer your prayers. Trust God that God does want to work in your life. Trust in God and what God has done for you. For some of us in this room, it's trusting that God will save you. It's believing that God did in fact send his son Jesus to die the death that you deserve because of your sin and rebellion. He did in fact send his son Jesus who rose again three days later to give you the gift of life abundant and eternal. And for you this morning, it's that first step of trust. It's giving your life to Jesus, repenting of your sins and giving your life to him by faith, believing that he died and rose again for you. Trust, think about this, start small. I think when it comes to prayer, if we're real honest, a lot of of us are just intimidated. Like you think in your mind, I got to pray for an hour a day or two hours or, you know, all this kind of stuff. The Bible says pray without ceasing. So I got to walk around praying all the time. And listen, just start small. How long is the Lord's prayer? Four verses, at least in Luke's gospel, four verses. Listen, listen, I think it's wonderful to spend long times in prayer with the Lord. I wish I could say I did that every day. I don't, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But here's what I've tried to do in my prayer life, just be consistent. So I'm saying, be consistent. And you can, you can be consistent. You can get up in the morning and think through this Lord's prayer. You can start tomorrow morning as you get out of bed. Lord, you're my father, thank you. I wanna worship you today. And I wanna live for your kingdom today. Will you help me with that? Will you give me all that I need to live for your kingdom today? You can do that. You can take five minutes in the morning and begin to pray through, not as a rote memory kind of prayer, but but think through what Jesus is teaching us and and pray this prayer. You can do that. You can start small. And then what you're gonna find is the same thing I found, that, that, that as I pray consistently, it gives me a desire to want to pray longer and to pray more, but just start, start small. But not only start small, start big. We've already talked about that in some regard. For some of us, our prayers are way too small. God, help me pass the test. Now, I know you need to pass your test. I get it. God, give me the promotion. I know you need a promotion. I get all that. But I just don't think those prayers are big enough. The big prayer is what? Your kingdom come. Because God, when your kingdom comes, everything is right. And so God, your kingdom come in my life. Your kingdom come in my family's life. Your kingdom come in this world. Father, change me, transform me. That's the prayer you need to be praying. That's the prayer that you and I need to pray on a regular, consistent basis. And that's the prayer that's at the heart of what Jesus is teaching us in this Lord's prayer or disciples prayer. Does that make sense? So you start small, be consistent. But but while you're being small, right? You're just making that time every day. At the same time, be big. Be bold, be persistent, right? And start responding. The best way you can pray is how? With your Bible open. Why? Come on now, because God speaks to you through his word. He speaks to you through, he doesn't speak to you through a hunch, right? 
or intuition, right? God speaks to you through his word. And when you open up scripture, like we did last week, and you read about Mary and Martha and that devotion we talked about last week, man, something like that leads me to pray. God, I, I wanna have that heart that just wants to sit at your feet and grow. Cultivate that in me. God's speaking to me. He's convicting me as I'm reading it and I'm responding. Or this week for me, as I was just thinking through this idea of father, man, you know, just to think again, he's my father who's rescued me. And how often I, you know, tend to see God as this far away God instead of a God who's near and present, wise and rescuing. God, help me to see you for who you are. You see, as I'm reading scripture prayerfully, I respond to what God is saying to me in his word. It is always wise to pray with your Bible open or as you read the Bible, respond to God in prayer. Think about this, start intercessing. Start praying for others. Your kingdom come, not only in my life, but my kids. Lord, your kingdom come in their lives. May they see that the best way to live is to live for you. And the people I love and the people I don't know yet, intercessing and start accepting. You think about Paul, right? Paul had this thorn in the flesh. We don't know exactly what it was, but Paul says, Lord, I prayed. I prayed three times for you to take this thorn in the flesh away, but you didn't. But here's what I learned. Your grace is sufficient for me and your power is made known in my weakness. Listen, there are gonna be times, you know it, when you pray and you're praying for something and God does something else. But listen, listen, that something else that God does is always better than what you were originally praying for. You see what I'm saying? Accept that. Accept that, that, that God knows better than you do. God, God sees more than you see. And God, God wants what's better than what you want for yourself. And so just accept that sometimes your prayers aren't gonna be answered in the way that you think they need to be answered because God is doing something far greater in your life than what you can understand or see. You see what I'm saying? All I'm telling you this morning is that you have this invitation on the table that the God of all creation is saying to you and me, come, I'm your father. You can talk to me. You can spend time with me and I can change your life. And so I don't know what it is for you, but for you this week, there are probably some steps that you need to take to begin spending some time with the Lord more consistently. It might be rearranging your schedule just a bit. It might just be being more intentional with your time. I have no idea, but here's what I do know, that every single one of us need to take what Jesus says in these verses and this week, this week, today, we need to begin putting him in the practice because we have a father who's longing for intimacy with us. Maybe you're here this morning and the reason why you struggle so much with prayer is because you don't know God. You don't know the one who came and lived for you, the life that you could not live and then went to a cross and died for you and rose again. And so for you, maybe there's someone in this room this morning that what you need to experience today is the gift of salvation. You need to be born Again, And so maybe as we have a time invitation today for you, it's just making a decision to turn from your sins and turn to Christ by faith. In the corners of this room are two crosses. There'll be uh, someone at, at those crosses ready to receive you this morning. If you wanna give your life to Jesus, go to one of those crosses. Let us pray with you and help you begin a relationship with Jesus. If you're watching online, you see uh, a number on the screen, text the name Jesus to that number. We'll reach out to you today and begin helping you to have a relationship with Jesus. Or if you wanna come down front, I'll be down front. We'd love to talk to you about how you can begin a relationship with Jesus. I don't know how God is leading you to respond in these moments, but I know that he is. You obey his voice. Father, thank you that you love us and care for us. Thank you that you're good. Thank you that you desire communion with us. Help us. Help us. That's what we need. We need help. Renew our desire to come before you, to cry out to you, to seek you. And thank you that you're faithful, that you call us to come to you boldly and persistently. If there's someone in this room this morning who's never placed his faith or her faith in Jesus, I pray that person will come and trust you as Lord for the very first time. Lord, have your way, I ask, and ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You rise to your feet as we have a time of invitation together. You come now as the Spirit of God leads you.